a great one with the Seahawks, Lofa Tatupu. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll let you say that. Tatupu. Who was a fantastic Tatupu. linebacker for the Seahawks. He's going to join us here in about 20 minutes to talk about Seattle. Boy, they came out of the gate like gangbusters against Ooh. the Colts. Ooh, I watched that game, too, today. Okay. Ooh, woo. Okay. Ooh, ooh. Did they just manhandle the Colts? Because that's, that's well, what it sounded like. Well, okay, they did. Most of the times, but more percentage toward them, I would say 65% of the time up front, which was shocking, especially defensively. I thought, you know, I think Indianapolis Colts' offensive line is pretty good. And they got after him. I don't know. Man, ooh. Carson Wentz was taking a shot. Hey, by the way, all those naysayers that talk about Carson Wentz, he actually played pretty solid considering how much pressure and everything else was involved in that game. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh, so... Yeah, that, he looked he looked pretty good to me. <laughs> Russell Wilson just looked like, you know, that's why I'm one of the best to do it in this era. Uh, so he always gets underestimated, but he played phenomenal uh, in that game. And, uh, you know, they're one in the, uh, <laughs> you know, the McVay-style offense, another, you know, guy they pulled from uh, that staff. And uh, now they seem like they're on the same page. But it was just one game. But they, the physicality was there. Uh, Daryl Taylor from uh, UT was out there. I know yeah. last year he was a little banged up, and he played his last year at UT, you know, with a high ankle sprain, so he wouldn't you know, get their full sense of how good he could be. He, he was impressive. Their D-line was impressive. They were doing a lot of five-man front, too. That's the Colts. They were, they were humming. Uh, yeah, Jamal Adams was doing his thing, too. And I, I thought, you know, you know, just reading all the articles, they were like, oh, well, they didn't use him. He kept play deep. Well, he still was somewhat of a factor. He was still all over the place. They just they just contained him a little bit because they, they they got ahead, you know. But the coach drove right down and got a, a field goal or a touchdown right off the bat. Right, their opening drive was, yeah. I guess, yeah, pretty good. Some of the best football they played all day. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, this, this Seahawks team is uh, it's going to be a huge one. But I wouldn't be shocked if the Titans came out there and played them close to the vest all the way through. All the way, especially with that atmosphere, home opener. The pressure's on the Seahawks. Guess what? If That's what the NFL is all about. How do you respond after you got busted in the mouth and, and looked horrible? So one thing we do know is they're not going to look like, like if they look like they did against uh, Arizona, oh, there's, there's going to be some heads rolling real quick. Yeah, yeah, and that's a long flight back. Uh-oh. It's going to be a lot of discussions if they come out there and lay an egg again. And it won't be good. Somebody, somebody's, yeah, it's a, I wouldn't be shocked if something crazy happened, like somebody got cut. Yeah, they they look like they did versus, yeah, that somebody will get cut. A name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that means that those star-studded players is making the big dough. Somebody's not living up to the billing. Don't happen two weeks in a row. Not like that. I think people have kind of taken a breath over the course of the week. Just about, it's just one game. It just happened to be the first game. There was all this hype. This was Mm -hmm. the first game. It seems like everybody has a game during some season where they just, somebody just shows up and they just whip you like the Titans did to the Bills last year. Oh, it It happened through my career. I mean, every year you're always going to have a stinker. You just don't even want it to be the first game. First game. That, that, That usually doesn't happen. Like, not to good teams, which I think this is a good team. I think the Titans have a really good team. Like, yeah, it could be a, a con- Super Bowl contending type team in, a, you know, the AFC, which I think is really, really tough, uh, The you know, the top-tier teams. Well, I go back to the, the year and a half, basically, that Wisenhunt was the coach. Remember, he won both of his openers. When he had a whole year to prepare for somebody, he was undefeated. And the second year, they beat the brakes off the Buccaneers, and he never won another game. They beat him like 42 to 14. So both of those years, Titans fans are probably super excited after the first game, and then we know how those seasons ended. Not it good. is just one game, but with the expectations and then how they got beat, I think that's more concerning. This is nothing to do. Everybody's pissed off, you know, organization, coaches. But at the end of the day, this one here, I mean, I've been saying and leaning on it, coaches, everybody's involved. Ultimately, the players on the field got punched. Yep. I mean, man. And they 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 didn't punch back to, long enough, they, so that it was on the players all day long. I mean they they got beat in the trenches up front majority of the game, and uh, they didn't have a response. And if you don't take that personal, you can do it however you want to do it in the National Football League. They disrespected. 
the Arizona Cardinals disrespected your entire team. If you're a leader on the team, you're going on sitting at lunch, talking to different guys, asking them, hey, man, I'm hearing around the league. They disrespect us. They ain't respect Tannehill. They ain't respect the offensive line. Yep. They think LaJuan is soft. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's what's going on. That's, that's what people are saying. Nah, uh-uh. Mm-mm. Is, you know, <laughs> the competitive nature, which is dangerous in the National Football League, is cancerous. In a, in a way that can be really dangerous on game day. So you tried to ignite that thing all the way through the middle of the week after, you know, all the way to the end, to the next game. Mm-hmm. That's just some of the most competitive people alive. And so you want to see how they respond. You gonna, It's going to be a gut punch, and, and the leaders and everybody else on the team, they're like, hey, man, it ain't like that no more. I don't want to see all the jumping around, getting all, oh, talking that crap. Mm-mm. I'm all about them actions. Stop all of that. So, you know, LaJuan was talking about he got too juiced and all that. You know, that didn't sound real good to me. That, that, it, it, you know, today, I think on Jim Wyatt's uh, Twitter handle, I think Lucas has that. I, I, I didn't, I, you know, as much as all of that might have been true, you can't say it. Yeah. It was no different than Jamar Chase in preseason for the Bengals, the wide receiver saying that the ball is bigger in the that, NFL and it doesn't have that's white that's stripes that's on it. <laughs> you know, so, you know, that's why I'm having drops. Right. That probably all is true, but I don't want to hear that. You're getting paid millions of dollars. Catch the freaking ball. I don't care if it's a tennis ball, a golf ball, a football. Catch it. Don't give me no excuses. And that's what, you know, that's what LaJuan sounded like. I don't want to hear that. On my knee. Nobody care about that. You was out there. You better sleeve it up, put some icy hot on that thing, and put it on fire and let rock and roll. Let's go. Mm-mm, or what? Now they got all this, what's, you know, they can put all this. Stretch stuff to keep you, you know, your stuff warmed up, you know. Hey, man, you got to do what you got. You got to figure it out. Don't let that happen again. Because if, if they don't do that, then they need to do two tight ends. And guess what that means? You won't be on team next year because you're getting paid a lot of money to go one-on-one versus the elite pass rushers. Right. You're getting paid so there's not a tight end over on your side ever. Yeah. Right. We, we need two tight ends the way that look. Rob in Nashville is hearing this. He wants to join the discussion on the Mark Spain Real Estate Hotline. What's up, Rob? Thanks for calling Blaine and Mickey. Hey, hey, what's up, guys? Thank y'all for taking my call. Yeah, man. Uh, just listening to you guys and everything about, you know, the Titans and everything. You know, um, you know, for anybody saying that, you know, that was, that was just a game, well, they, they right in, in a sense. But, you know, how bad that the Titans got beat, I mean, to me, <laughs> that's just, I mean, that, that looks so terrible. And the uh, and, uh, first game, too, uh, so I think people just really in that uproar, and they got a right to be because those are household names on the Titans team. I mean, we, they used to get generic people. <laughs> now they, they went from cornflakes to Kellogg's now. So, hey, it's no excuse no more. I mean, we got the big top main guys out there. So, you know, if they don't win this week here, you know, uh, it, it might won't be too bad. But they if they get blown out, I mean, they going to they gonna have – they gonna have a real high heel to climb, and you know not to not to say you know they gonna have to carry the name Powder Puff Team like you know they used to call them Powder Puff Blue. So they just gonna have to eat that. Thank you guys. Mm. <laughs> generic, <laughs> that, that generic people. Yeah, well, then he went cornflakes. You know, so that was that was really good. Though. Oh man, that was yeah, a fantastic yeah, they, call. Man. Hey, they they better unleash. And when I say unleash. You know, there's a lot of different phrases, whatever, you know, you need to get going. But that eye, that tiger, that thing better be unleashed. And that doesn't mean you're going to win. I mean, then you you better say, hey, man, when they get off that field, they're going to say, hey, man, that Titan team, that was a heck of a battle. Win, lose, or draw. Can't walk away looking like how they looked this last game. No way, no how. It's personal now. Nah. We, not, we, we can't play that. Well, one thing is, you're on the road. I, I've heard you talk about this some Kevin Dyson, too. It's, it's no distractions. It's only the team. You're off by yourselves, and you're going to be however many thousand miles away. I mean, Seattle's about as far as you can get from Nashville and still play NFL game in the United States. 
you're a long way from home. I mean, hopefully that is a focusing thing for this team because it, those fans hadn't been in that stadium for a year, I don't think. It is going to be like a jet air, airplane engine out there. And you've talked about it before. I said it's the loudest outdoor stadium I play. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I, I couldn't hear the guy right next to me. And he's yelling. Yep. I'm like, man, I, uh, we can't even hear it sitting on the bench. I mean, it, was, it was just, yeah, that, this is this was going to be an interesting one. It's going to be, it's, it's definitely going to, you know, it, this is adversity at its highest right here. Because yep. the odds are against him. That's why I'm saying you got to go out here and you got to look how you're supposed to look. Win, lose, or draw. Then you can move forward and say, okay, we, had, we, we left one get away. We got our butts kicked. And then we, you win, lose, or draw this next game. We're fine. Now we know where we need to be. Maybe that game, maybe the first game was more preseason-ish for some yeah. of those guys yep. because they hadn't played in a game. Some of them. Mm-hmm. W- whether they were available or not, uh, they hadn't played. And, you know, COVID too. So, you know, uh, as an athlete, you can never talk about excuses of why you played the way you played. You just can't do it. And it's funny, you know, I kind of learned that as a player because I'm up here talking to different players and teammates, ah, man, you got a little ankle sprain, you know, can you, you can play, you about 85. <laughs> Somebody really, man, you, you, you be, you be 85% going out there against AB. One on one. Nobody talking about my ankle taped, and I got extra tape on there. So yeah, man. <laughs> so well, hey, I brought up one day. You know, well, you know that guy was only seventy percent or whatever, and you're like, no, no, stop, stop. Yeah. If you suit up, then you said I'm good to go. I'm good to go. If you put on the uniform and you went out there, <laughs> nobody cares. Yeah. If your leg was broke. Yeah. Hey man, sorry, you suited up. Yeah. You got to eat whatever sandwich you get served out there because you you put the uniform on and played. Can't have sympathy. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm gonna give you a good example. I tore my meniscus. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I got surgery. I couldn't practice. My knee swole up every week. Didn't practice all week. Sat in the chair outside and practice. Yeah, that's what. I drained my knee on game day, and then I play. <laughs> Whether I play good, bad, or different, nobody. I, I'm not gonna sit and say, "Hey, man, I got part of my meniscus missing, and you know it swelled up on that one play, and it was swollen the whole time, even though I had a knee sleeve on it, and it just today it got locked up, and it just I didn't go well." Yeah. N- you never heard that from me. No. Nah, once you dress up and suit out, all bets are off. Nope, no can do. So stop that. Nobody cares. You're making millions of dollars. Nobody. You know, nobody cares about that. If a time you're supposed to, as, as much as everybody deceives the media anyway in their conversation from coach to player, this is a time you're supposed to do that. Yeah. No, I, I just stuck it up. I didn't play well. Right. And you don't want to give a tip to another team anyway. Oh, my knee was that. Well, I'm going to test your knee out then. I might go dive right at your ankle and make you think I'm going to hit your knee. Mm-hmm. Yeah, then, you know, so don't, don't make up excuses. Sorry, even though they're true. Don't do it. So we'll play LaJuan when we come back. We got Lofa Tatupu also. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, we should play it for him and see what he thinks about that. <laughs> He's going to give a response like you did. We'll get to that <laughs> next for sure. Uh, Lofa Tatupu, former Seattle Seahawks, uh, three-time Pro Bowler, set to join us next. We'll talk Titans and Seahawks on Blaine and Mickey. Watch your favorite 104.5 The Zone shows and interact with other Zone listeners in the chat, live on Twitch and YouTube. It's 104.5 The Zone TV.
Network doing great work out there covering the Seahawks. Um, I, I know your dad was a great Patriot, Mosey, and I'm old enough, very old oh, enough yeah. to, re- to remember watching him play. I was a big fan of him. I just loved how he played and how he hustled, and he had a cool name, and he looked cool. And I know Sam <laughs> Bam Cunningham was his teammate, was a very important guy in your life, a fellow Trojan. Uh, my condolences, because I know you talked about that on the show this week. Uh, Sam Bam oh, was, was – yeah. Sam Bam you know, changed the face yeah. of college football, Lofa, and I know you talked about it. Oh, yeah, he changed the, the face of college football. He um, he changed several lives off the field, which was really how he impacted me. When I went out to Southern Cal, I grew up in Massachusetts because my dad played for New England. I didn't know anybody out there, but my dad slid me a number. My mom said, yo, you need anything, just hit him up, even just to watch football because I was, I was five hours north of them with traffic, you know, so I – I didn't go home very often, but Sam would come watch football with me on campus. Um, he was just, he was a, a uncle, a father figure, everything. And uh, I love Sam Bam. Well, uh, again, condolences. I know he was important to you, but let's talk some football. Let's look ahead to uh, this game. But before we do, my gosh, uh, your team, the Seahawks, played one heck of a complete game on Sunday, right out of the gate. Oh, it was the most incredible early week or first month performance I've seen out of a Pete Carroll led team. And uh, we've seen, you know, a lot of good teams pass through there. Right. So um, every phase offense, defense, special teams came to play uh, particularly impressed because, you know, it's a road game an early start and uh, they really just found a way. Uh, they cracked a, a formula that, that we had trouble with back in, uh, back in our early 2000s. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, absolutely. Lofa Tatupu, our guest here, you can follow him at Lofa Tatupu 51 on Twitter. Well, I know uh, Lofa that, uh, that Pete Carroll's birthday was sometime. I don't know how old he is now, but he sure seems old. He, yeah, he's still kicking it, man. But maybe that was an early birthday gift there from beating the Colts the way that they did, man. And have they talked about, you know, what's the recipe to, to looking so good and, and so healthy and running around like he's a young, you know, whippersnapper coach, uh, Pete Carroll? Yeah, I mean, I thought he had a lot of energy when he was 50 to ask me at SP, but <laughs> The guy's the the coach the coach version of Benjamin Button. He's just age in reverse. <laughs> um, I you know I've been trying to give him some of my zone in CBD. I don't know if he's taking it, but maybe that could help him. <laughs> it's what's gotten me back to peak performance. But uh, no, nah, his uh, his his you know competitive spirit is incredible. I'm talking up there with the ranks, the like of Tom Brady, Michael Jordan, Kobe, like all the greats. They they hate losing coin tosses. They hate losing you know. Um, uh, yeah, just any Rochambeau, box paper scissors. Like Pete would get pissed off if he if he uh-huh. lost, you know, uh, a game of that. So it's a special thing when that transforms over into the players and uh, and they take the ownership of the team upon themselves. Well, naturally, uh, Lofa, uh, you know the the Titans got select and and a lot of the players, at least offensively, didn't play very much, if at all, in preseason. I just mm-hmm. want to ask you guys. I know every team is so different. But did uh, did your guys, uh, did the Seahawks offense and defense uh, starters play in the preseason? And if they did, how much or, or, you know, did they play at all? No, that was our primary concern, you know, on our podcast. It was like, well, we don't know how good this new offense of Shane Waldron is because we haven't seen Russ or any of the guys out there. And um, I don't know, but defensively, I'll say that playing all those young guys and, and the, the non-starters, it really looked good for us in the, in the opening game because – I'm telling you, I don't know if we've ever had a D-line as deep as this. Maybe maybe that 13, 2013 Super Bowl champion team. Oh. But it's incredible. They just kept reloading and getting after Carson Wentz in that Colts offense. Well, speaking of the D-line, I guess tell us a little bit about uh, Taylor who went to UT so we know a little bit about him and kind of his impact here, uh, you know, going into his second season. He's had the best camp. He's an athletic freak of nature. Mm-hmm. Um you know, great in space, and, you know, it's rare for a kid that primarily rushes, you know, uh, the quarterback to, to operate in space the way he does. But that's why they took him so high. And, unfortunately, he had the uh, injury last year. But he's come back. He's looked apart. Um, and, man, he could, he could do it all. It's incredible. Well, Lofa, I, you know, I don't watch Russell Wilson all the time. I, I respect his game. He's one of the best to do it. Uh, but, man, it just seemed like he was playing with a lot more emotion after he threw some of these – these, uh, you know, touchdowns, and he was just yeah. pumping the ground. And I was like, man, he looks like he's on a mission. He's kind of always stoic and kind of under control. You know, he gives a fist pump, like, you know, just right there, kind of the Tiger Wood type. But he was pumping yeah. it to the ground. I thought he was going to, you know, uh, get injured pumping uh, pumping his fist like that. Uh, do you think he's on a mission this season? I, I think you hit it on the head right there because I've never seen a Russell Wilson 
celebrate almost. I mean, you know, he expects to throw the perfect pass. He expects because that's how hard he mm-hmm. was. But I've never seen him have that kind of emotion. And so it, it feel like it just it means a little more. And, I mean, I think going into his 10th season, realizing that, you know, he's, he, even if he plays 20 years, he's on the back half of the season of his, of his career. So um, I don't know. I think it's just it was something special to see him get that excited because the team feeds off of him, man. As, three, as number three goes, the rest of the team goes. It seems like it's a perfect match with Shane Waldron and him as the OC and running this offense. Kind of take us through why this offense it fits with Russell Wilson's skill set and the Seahawks offense running, you know, running the football and, and, you know, the Sean McVay style of offense. I mean, you know, they really had the running game going, which was a primary uh, point of emphasis for, uh, for Pete in the offseason when he was looking for a new coordinator. And um, I know that's really what they wanted to get back to because then it just opens up everything else for Russell. And um, especially with Russ's athleticism, I don't think Weldon's ever had a guy like that. So now the playbook's even more broadened or widened for, for, uh, for both of them. But the play action was hitting because Chris Carson and the O-line, they were just they were given just a little bit of space. He's one of the guys that can create on his own, very rare. Uh, he doesn't need much to, to get going. And, um, and then it just it, it all gelled perfectly. Mm. We're on with uh, Lofa Tututu, uh, former NFL three-time Pro Bowl middle linebacker for Seattle Seahawks. Lofa, Tyler Lockett is one of those guys. I think he was underestimated for so long. People don't even know how to estimate oh, him any, anymore. He <laughs> came into league as a spectacular special teamer, and he's that rare little dude who can pretty much do everything, including just run right past you. <laughs> you know, every it seems like every couple of years or, you know, so we get a guy who is just, so phenomenal. I mean, and just in, in the not in the spotlight. I mean, we think back to the rush of Cliff Averill, who I think he had he led the league in active force fumbles with like 32 in this time here. And then you go to KJ Wright, who I mean, 130 plus tackles every year, sacks, interceptions, everything. But for some reason, they just the spotlight's not big enough for everybody, right? And uh, Tyler Lockett is one of the most incredible football players instinctually I've ever seen. His spatial awareness knowing where the defender is, even if he has his back turned to them and his eyes on the quarterback, the timing of coming back to the ball, catching it with his hands, not his body. And like that last, that first touchdown pass, the first play uh, pass of the season, the Willie Mays-esque catch, he looks over one shoulder, (laughs) the ball floats to the right. He doesn't turn his head, he just looks backwards. And it's like, he makes it look so routine that I think people thought it just really wasn't that hard of a catch. But, I mean, tell you, if you, you go out in the backyard, you, you video yourself trying to do that a couple of times, it's going to take you more than once to catch that ball. Well, and, you know, you mentioned the running back, Carson, and I asked you about Tyler Lockett. Heck, we hadn't even gotten into DK Metcalf yet. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, freak of nature. I mean, it's um, the only reason he didn't get drafted in the top ten was because he didn't he didn't make it through all all three seasons or four seasons healthy. But the guy's unbelievable. They love him in the locker room. Um, I mean, he, he has sprint uh, Olympic speed, right? I mean, we saw him go out there for the trials. So it's um, and then we haven't even talked about Gerald Everett, who I thought looked spectacular too. A yep. new acquisition. Mm-hmm. So there's no shortage of weapons here, and um, it's just gonna it's gonna be fun to watch how this continues to develop. I love Everett uh, as a, a tight end, very athletic, uh, loafer. But man, DK Metcalf, give us a little backdrop on what is he like outside of football, like his, his personality. Because they, I watched that Colts game. I don't think he got a target in the first half, did he? Maybe one. No. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, he, is he like a diva? Like when in the halftime, like, hey man, y'all need to give me the ball. No. 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 no see, no, that's what not. I want to. I want to know what who he is. He's so far from that, it's the opposite. And in fact, you can point back to the, uh, the Arizona Cardinals game last year, Sunday Night Football. It was an absolute shootout. Uh, I think Tyler Lock had four touchdowns. He had like almost 200 yards. And DK might have had like three targets that whole game. But what does he do? He makes the play of the game. He runs down um, Buda Baker, who broke on that right. uh, interception, right. took it. And, you know, Buddha was like, I'm not going to get caught. He looked up at the Jumbotron and tried to pick up his knees because he, he, he was getting hawked. And uh, that just shows you, DK, he just wants to win. And um, he didn't complain. Like, when they when they came to him on the sideline, he was like, hey, man, I'm going to do whatever it takes to win. And there was no no second thought when he was chasing down uh, Buddha on that one. Man, what cornerback do you think DK Metcalf would say, all right, man, he, he's probably the best I, I face every year? Uh, I'd, I'd say only Jalen Ramsey. I really, I think that's, you know, um, yeah, he's Stephon Gilmore, who, 
<laughs> yeah, Stephon Gilmore, who was coming off of the uh, the player of the year just uh, two years ago when they had their matchup, and they were pretty much – they just put him over DK. DK had a big game in a big way, and, uh, and he let him know about it, and it got kind of chippy because I don't think Gilmore, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, I still think he's unbelievable, but he, he just knew it, it was – he was the guy he needed help with. And uh, I don't – Jalen, I think they could match him up, and, and you know, it should, it should be a bat, clash of the Titans. No pun intended. <laughs> Lofa, so Tupu, our guest. So let me ask you this. Pete Carroll calls you. He said, you've been watching the film on these Titans. How do you how do you stop this attack? Because, they, I mean, they, they got A.J. Brown. They got Julio. Oh, they got man. Tannehill. They got Henry. Uh, and I'll, I, I say that asking, knowing full well, they got stopped in week one. But how do you stop them in week two? Well, you know, the ground game is my biggest concern. And, you know, um, you know the Colts, they, they seemingly abandoned the run against us. And I think maybe that's how stout, hopefully that's how stout we are on defense. But I don't know if that's true of the case in that first drive. They moved the ball pretty well. They just, I think they gave up on it too soon. So I'm interested to see how this Derrick Henry and this ground game gets going. And if that's there, again, you know, it makes it so much easier. You know, Julio and um, AJ, they don't need, they don't need much help. You know, no, however long they've been in the league, they never really needed help. Even if it's double coverage, but, they're going to see a secondary that I don't know if it's going to stand up, you know, the way if we have to put eight in the box to take care of Henry, I don't know how well we fare out there on the outside, um, you know, at corner. So we'll see. That's my primary emphasis is you got to stop the run game or else you have no chance against the Titans. Lofa Tatupu, our guest, uh, Believe Podcast Network covering the Seattle Seahawks. Well, Lofa, in that game versus the Colts, the Seahawks looks like where they were doing like five D linemen from. Did I miss yeah. see that? That kind of take us through what that was like, and did they actually do that? Because that, that was kind of interesting to see that. I had never seen that before. They did, and it was um, it's a defense they went to a little later in the season last year. It's called the stick defense, where it's uh, three down, and it's really five two if you really because it's right. more of a five two than it is I think a three for true three four. But you got the Mike and the Will covered up, so it's, it's really hard to run against that. I think really the only the only plays that you can really have success because you're not going to get it downhill, but I think maybe off tackle, some power counter row is a, is a best way to go against that. If you had to, that's what we've seen have success against it, at least last year. Um, but then they moved away from it and, and got into some cover two looks. They, you know, just a tiny bit of quarters. It was incredible. Uh, Ken Norton called a phenomenal game last week. And I think when you have the success you're having rushing the passer and, and, you know, up front, just taking the fight to the offensive line, it makes it much easier. Kind of just like Shane Waldron could call what he wanted in most cases last week because of the, uh, the run game success. It was the same way for, for Kenny Newark. Well, offensively, also the things that I saw is that the Titans are going to have to be really disciplined defensively because I saw a lot of eye candy and misdirections. What would you say about that offense? Did you see some of that or or, or you didn't? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I mean, you. I think we ran our first ever successful, uh, you know, that, that fly, uh, the fly sweep. <laughs> That's uh, the first time I think it actually get, it got 11 yards with DJ, uh, <laughs> DJ Eskridge. So, I was like, man, that's incredible. We, we finally, uh, and when you hit on that play, now it's, you know, the ends can get a little, uh, like you're saying, eye candy or nosy looking for that sweep instead of staying down. And that's when Chris Carson can crease you coming off that backside tackle. But um, it was, like I said, it was an incredible game plan. But even more so, I was just impressed with the execution because the starters, as we mentioned, did not get many reps in, uh, in uh, preseason. Well, the AFC West was undefeated in the first week, for what it's worth, and the NFC West was undefeated. If you were going to choose one team from the NFC West, because I think it's the best, that's not going to make the playoffs. Everybody can't make the playoffs. Which team yeah. is not going to make the playoffs from the NFC West? If you you thought all of them were going to be contenders, I don't think the 49ers. I don't think they make it. Um, you know, the Rams look good. Uh, the Niners, they look good. I don't know how we don't know how good Detroit is yet, but. I, I believe that the Colts are a formidable opponent, and I think they're going to give you guys a run for the, the league, um, for your division. Um, I'm afraid of the team you guys just played. Yeah, I get it. I'm afraid of the Cardinals, man. They look – that with the pieces they added, J.J. Watt and uh, and then getting David Collins in the first round. Isaiah Simmons looks every bit the first rounder they wanted. Chandler Jones, the, one of the most underrated, you know, 15-sack guys a season I've ever heard of. Man, it's uh, – they got a lot of weapons over there. And then A.J. Green and, uh, and D-Hop on the offense. But I think the Niners are the team that does not make it. And I think so because, well, they just lost their starting running back. But then, so injuries always play a part. But 
they really I when when they show a glimpse of like maybe oh oh no what's gonna happen? Are they gonna put in Trey Lance? And I think when you have two quarterbacks, you have none, right? That's the old saying. Mm-hmm. You don't have one. So I wonder how that's gonna unfold and will they ever go to Trey Lance over Garoppolo? Uh, Lofa, this has been fantastic stuff. It's been great talking to you. Uh, before we go, there's just there's a huge story out there in college football, and you know we're sitting down here in the South. Everybody loves college football. What in the <laughs> world are you are your USC Trojans going to do? Uh, you know, down here, everybody's everybody's looking at the uh, Jaguars coach, saying, "Well, why don't they just call Urban and get him?" <laughs> but what do you want to happen, and what do you think will happen? Well, you know, we got uh, Mike Bone, the the athletic director that came in, uh, I believe, from Cincinnati. You know, I, yeah, I think they got the right guy there, um, and I think he'll make the right judgment. I think moving on, you know, I don't know whether that was the right call. You know, it, we, you know, been stagnant kind of for, for a while since that first season when Clay was hot. Uh, I think Clay is an incredible offensive play caller. But as a head coach, you know, it's tough when you, when you get your shot and putting together the staff and everything you, you need to go right and have success. I mean, as Pete, we could, we could point to Pete, and I think it took three or four tries for him to get it right, even, even when he came to college. So um, it's not easy, but, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm proud of my alma mater. We're going to fight on it. We're going to figure it out. And um, we, need, we need to return to uh, that, that playoff picture at least in, in the next uh, with whoever we select next. And I'm, I'm going to say it right now. My choice would be Chris Richard. Played with the guy, coached with the guy. We just watched his defense uh, secondary, you know, give Green Bay fifth. So, uh, you know, if anybody's listening out there, Chris Richard, that's my choice. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. well, it's good stuff. We'll put that name out there for sure. Here's the thing. College football is better when USC is great. It is. It's better when USC is great. They're one of those programs that make college football better. Yeah, I agree, brother. I agree. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Lofa Tatupu. Hey, man, we'll do it again sometime. Uh, at Lofa Tatupu 51 on Twitter. Follow him there or uh, catch him on the Believe Podcast Network covering the Seahawks. We teased this earlier. Taylor LeWan talking after practice today. We've got the audio. What did he say about his performance? Well, you'll hear it straight from LeWan when we come back. Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. Coming up tomorrow with Buck Rising. Last show before the Vols will play Tennessee Tech and the Titans will travel to Seattle. We will talk about it with John Reed of Fox Sports Knoxville and break down the Titans game with Coach Dave McGinnis of Titans Radio. The Buck Rising Show. Tomorrow, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on 104.5 The Zone.
And when somebody calls from Philly, we got to hear from them first. What's going on, Big Mike? Thank you for calling. All right. What's going on, guys? What's going, going on? Us? All right. Good evening, uh, Franklin. So uh, the company moved me down here, so that's why I call in a lot. But, oh, okay. uh, Blaine, Thanks. I want to thank you again for all your uh, good play for uh, my Philadelphia Eagles uh, <laughs> over the years, man. So appreciate all your work and everything. And uh, as you know, the Big Five in Philadelphia basketball is huge. And I played for St. Joe's there. We yes. were able – I think basketball players are so different from football mm-hmm. because we have more games. We were able to recover – after a bad loss because we have another game two days later. Yep. How did you do it, or how can the Titans do it by having six days in between? How can they recover? What's the main difference for a football player to recover versus basketball? Well, it's kind of, it was, you know, as a defensive back, and I, I think everybody's personality is different. That's what you must understand. Some guys can say, ah, I laid an egg and watch the film and then be done with it. What for me, I was kind of that blue collar guy. So I wanted I wanted to stew on it to get me ignited for that next game. Mm-hmm. So everybody's personality is different. It's no different than after you lose a game and you're flying back. You know, some guys on there, oh, having great conversation, laughing, and giggling. And I'd walk by and say, Hey man, we lost by 30. What's so funny? It had nothing to do with the game. They go, Oh, you're too serious, Blaine. No, man, because you should be feeling like I do sick to your stomach. Mm-hmm. But everybody's not like that. You know, so you have to, you know, once you start practicing, you start preparing for your next opponent, then you kind of forget, and then you move towards focusing on the next opponent, so your focus should all go into the next opponent. And then that way you don't forget. That's why I say you never forget. And then when you line up out there, what you are going to make sure of that, we don't come out there flat from beginning to end. Uh, so we, you're going to know you've been in for a battle. You're going to be pissed off whether you win, lose, but you're going to say we're not putting that kind of product out there. Right. So that, that's kind of how you approach it. Uh, every player, his personality is so different. However you want to get motivated to make sure that you're ready to go full cylinder at the time and point of the game and kickoff is what you need to make sure you're focused on. So uh, it's tough because the media now and the media is so much bigger even than when I played is they're always constantly reminding you of how you played the week before, whether it was an individual performance or in this case, the team, they didn't play for, you know, they, they stunk. Uh, so it was all player driven to me. That's why I was asking Coach Mack, like, how are you as a play caller when nothing is working because everybody's playing like crap? How are you? How are you dialing up calls, especially offensively in this game when you got all these weapons? Right. So I think that's the toughest thing. So this one was all on the players to me. It is you can people can criticize the Bowen and, and Downing and everything else. We'll see as time goes on, but they, they couldn't do anything really. It's best off their personality and what they're trying to be. Uh, as an identity of a team, and which is a physical team, and, and run the football. Taylor Lewan spoke earlier today. A lot of people may be wondering what were his thoughts after the game. Well, he was on the fence line today. Uh, Jim Wyatt, as well as some other media members, caught up with him. This is, I believe, this is Wyatt's video. This is uh, Taylor Lewan talking about what went wrong. I don't know how much of a factor it was. Um, yeah, I think I put too much in the game. I got too excited. I. Uh, kind of maybe like got a little over excited before the game and when the game came I felt drained and legs felt heavy and had more anxiety I was more worried about messing up than I was um, being better you know like or, hel- or helping the team and you know I think um, I was trying to compensate in a certain couple of ways for my knee and you know that's that's uh, I've, I've spent a long time in this this league and have a, had a lot of success and uh, through those things, like year two with Whitney Merciless had, having a similar game, um, it's just it's it's something that I have to overcome and work through. And I, I plan on doing those things. So, you know, it's not easy. The tough 24 hours, but you gotta get over it and move on, and uh, hopefully play better next week. Uh, overhyped. Uh, yeah, he lost I'm, his I'm, legs. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say that they, that just perturbed me a little bit. O- only one part of that that I liked, so I'm going to just talk about that. The rest of that crap was, uh, it's, you know, excuses. He He's an eight-year veteran. Now, he should have talked about, I got to figure out how to play better with my knee. That's it. Right. Until I get up to speed of where I need to be. That's it. That, 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 listening to him, you know, uh, I got too hyped up. Blah, blah. This is your eight. I don't care what you did about getting too hyped up or down. It, 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 you should know all that already. Uh, so to me, it's all about, hey, I have to make some adjustments to how I'm going to play. And to be honest, Chandler Jones did some things to him really 
the first play of the game. I'm, I'm going to use that example. He went out for power blocking, which he should, Lawan, and Chandler Jones is really supposed to be outside. Mm-hmm. He ducks inside, and if he just gets enough on him to push him down the line, then that's a big play for the Titans. That guy took a huge risk because he's up there trying to play for a contract and wants, you know, tackle for losses. You know, so some of those plays were risk-driven by Chandler. And then I think it got in his head to a certain point after he gave up the first sack and he he lunged and he he rip moved him. So, you know, it to me, players should never make an excuse about anything. It, it, to be honest. It's just I don't think people want to hear that. I, I can't I, I don't think I, during my time with the tight, I don't remember anybody ever making an excuse for a bad play. Uh, you know, uh, all of us got beat, toasted, missed a tackle. You have to take ownership, and I think he's trying to it, but it's it's kind of a in a sympathetic way, like you want to feel sorry for him. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know why I feel that way when I hear him talk. I, I maybe he's just being contrite, but this is the time where you just you gotta you know don't tell the totality of the truth of what happened. Just say. Hey, I didn't play well enough. I'll learn from it, and I think that's what he's trying to say. And let's just move forward. Uh, so, and he needs to figure out how to play with his knee where he's at today. I don't know how good his knee. It could be ninety nine percent. It could be seventy five. I have no idea. But it's up to him to figure it out. Nobody, nobody's gonna feel sorry for him when he's out there. He was out there on the island. I didn't know, notice them making uh, any adjustments. They're like, hey man, you can pay those big bucks. You got to figure it out. So, hey. It's 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 tough when you're a public figure and when you get paid the big bucks, they expect big games, especially in, in big time moments from their big time players. And that that's an adage that's gone on for years. It's nothing new, and he's one of them. And they they really rely on him. I mean, he's a heck of a talent. So we must see is this something that may carry forward and that they may need to help him, depending on who they're facing. I mean, we just heard uh, Lofa on here talking about. Uh, you know, this may be the best D line they've had since the Super Bowl, and he act like they ate deep, like they was rotating them in, and they was getting after the coach. And we all know the coach offensive line. Maybe the tackles may be a little sketchy, right? But they, hey, they got the best guard maybe in the NFL. So, yeah, we you know all we got to do is this this just play now. Finally, we heard from him from you know an outlet outside of his own. So I guess that's cool on Thursday, but. Hey man, they just sh- show up and shut them up. <laughs> I'm, I'm, that's why I'm not real. I'm not real. I'm not real big on offensive linemen just being. I'm an old school and our offensive lineman. They be like, "What? We want to talk to the media? I don't want to be talking to no media right now, man. I'm, I'm just a ground and pound. The only time they're gonna say my name if I call for holding. Right. <laughs> so, right. So that, I'm cool with that. Yeah, I really hold every play. They just don't call it every day. <laughs> so that that's kind of how it is, man. So he, you know, this is a new era, uh, but he's super athletic, and uh, now he needs to show that he can play up to that contract and the big dough that he has. At the end of the day, nobody wants to hear the excuses. Sorry, Charlie. Hey, we all been there. Yeah, I wasn't saying that when I. Oh, he caught a touchdown on me when I had a a broken form with a plate and six screws in my arm, and I got a big cast on there and said, oh, I couldn't run quite as fast because the cast was weighing me down. Right. Well, you know, oh, the, the Rams beat me in for a touchdown in the Super Bowl, but I had the cast on my hand. I couldn't get a jam on them. That's kind of how it sounds. Like, no, no, you're out there. Ball. Ball. So that's it. We're going to ball out in the second hour of the show. Doug Matthews said to join us. He's a baller. You know that. He's going to tell us all about what's going on with the University of Tennessee. That's a little over 20 minutes away. But when we come back, Todd Downing spoke today. And uh, uh, if you were frustrated about maybe some of the reg- the bread and butter type plays that they normally call that work, if you were frustrated they didn't work, well, so was he. He explains next. Blaine and Mickey. The Titans and Seahawks go at it in the first road game of the season. Coverage with Buck Rising on the Lee Company Countdown to Kickoff. Starts Sunday at noon. Then the Titans and Seahawks kick it off at 325. On your home for Titans football. 104.5 The Zone.
stopping into town, and they'll get a nice check for the bus ride over. Uh, Vols got to figure out the quarterback situation. We're gonna Is get the quarterback into, controversy? They got to figure that out. <laughs> Hey man, if they, uh, we've but discussed the, the head coach is a quarterback guru though, right? He needs to start guruing though, right? Sometimes guruing is the hard thing is picking the right guy. Uh oh. So are you are you <laughs> okay, missing that he might have picked the wrong guy? Well, <laughs> I don't he think picked I'm the, the guy with a, a rocket launcher, but the launcher doesn't know where the rocket's going. The launcher has missed how many pl- how many plays? I don't know. Have they missed where a guy was running alone and could have scored? I'm gonna just go games. six. Six wide open. Okay. I don't know if that's right. I just I remember from watching the game. I, now he dropped I can think one of three on Hyatt. Each, I'm gonna go three each game. I don't know. Now he's had some drop, and he dropped one on Hyatt in the last game of yeah, the he play did. where he, he got did. hurt. You're right. But still, though, he's missed like a seam route where a dude was running, and there was only orange on the TV screen, like nobody else around. And that's I want to talk to uh, to coach about this because I think people are, we talked to him off the air a little bit yesterday, and uh, be interested to hear his thoughts on uh, who the quarterback should you be. You know what's going to create? It's going to get worse. If he doesn't play Joe Milton, and then they're playing Tennessee Tech, and then yeah. Hooker, even if Bailey gets in there and does and looks good, they're going to be like, what does against Tennessee Tech? It doesn't matter. He was going through executing the offense, and he was connecting. They could, he, Milton could still overthrow a guy wide open against Tennessee Tech. <laughs> yeah, because they're it doesn't matter. They was open. wide open. No it doesn't matter who, def- uh, you know, who it was yeah. against. He, they were wide open. Yeah, it's going to be some people open on So Saturday. how long do you continually let that happen? And, and how much grace are you giving the guy that you hand pick? Because that, to me, becomes the question. Because you handpicked this guy. You went and got him, and you already had a couple quarterbacks. Yeah, three. It was, it was, yeah, well, you had three. Now there's two. Yeah. So you give him a little more leash than the others. If they if you do sh- if they do play because Hooker to me is he looked like a better quarterback potentially he was going through progression reads he made some mistakes yeah did he fumble he threw the interception at the end but he looked like a quarterback and maybe it be me personally it's just how I like my quarterbacks to look he still is mobile I don't you know you know in college you got a mobile quarterback man you can do a lot of different things yep uh, so I think you almost have to I mean college football now. The mismatches you can create with I a like mobile quarterback. I, yeah, you, I, can't, you, yeah. I can't wait to see what Dougie says about that. Uh, now, the head coach can lean on that Milton is injured. So if he doesn't play, they didn't, you know, and a lot of coaches say, well, you know, you know, he doesn't lose his spot, you know, from, injured. from injury. He was playing solid. He just missed a couple balls. Well, no, he missed more than a couple balls. Right there, uh, Lucas. <laughs> Lucas, how many did he miss? Luke, I know Luke, Lucas, Lucas knows extens- well, extensive film. Cedric study Tillman completely. should have like four touchdowns on the season, so that, that at least that many. Yeah. Well, so how about put it in context? Tillman probably has about sixty yards in receiving yards. He should have like three sixty in receiving <laughs> he yards. Should be leading the league. No, <laughs> I mean he's feel bad for his he's draft. Screwed the guy. Be, he's be screwed the, the guy. Right yeah, his numbers are going to look like what you missing two hundred yards on there, man. It's two or three hundred yards on there. All right, I, I teased the Todd Downing. We'll get to that in just a second. Oh, Danny man. in the borough yes. wants to jump in this quarterback discussion real quick. Wow. What's going on, Danny? Thanks for calling the uh, Mark Spain Real Estate Hotline. Hey, what up, guys? So I made this point in the chat during Buck's show, but I think it bears repeating that when I see Milton under center with this team, it really seems like the rest of the team has to play down to his talent level. And it's a little bit annoying because to Hypel, I think that he likes the idea – of Milton far too much. And I think the idea of him is way better than what we're actually seeing on the field. We left at least 21 points right out there on the grass against Pitt because he's overthrowing guys who are doing their job. And if you're not doing your job for this team, then what the heck are you doing? You're holding them back. I think Hooker gives us a better chance to win. I think that you got to keep Milton's butt on the bench and teach him a lesson, and he's got to earn the job. I don't care if Heifel picked him. He owes me some a little bit more than what I'm seeing on the field. Straight up. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And at some point then, if you know, now that the players have seen Hooker play, if that can – man, you could start, you know, dividing the team, unless we you as a coach because you're you're giving this quarterback too long of a leash. Now, now here's what they can say. Now, and it costs him a game. Costs him a game. Cost and him guess, a guess what? Game. It also could cost him down the road. Let's look at the end. It could cost him going to a bowl game. I'm just throwing it out there. I don't know if it will or won't. We don't know how this season's going to end. They could 
win a game they're not supposed to win. But, you know, that's ca- kind of where it could lead to. You know, whether some people say they, they're going to get, you know, suspended from a bowl game or not, nobody knows what the NCAA is going to do at this point in time. But, uh, yeah, I, I think that's how I saw it. And it's, and, and it's tough because Hypo's in a tough pos- position at this point, and he can hang on to that injury to help him. Mm-hmm. But I know if it was him, he wants the easy route, and hopefully Milton goes out there and just tears up, you know, Tennessee Tech. And to me, all three of the quarterbacks should play in this game if they're if Milton's healthy. But if they're not, both court Bailey should get in this game. And not to say that because he should get a shot is they should be in in a position where he should be able to play. Right. Mm-hmm. It should be forty eight to nothing or whatever. He or, should be able to play and then you showcase his talents. Everybody, yes. In in this offense in live bullets so everybody can see. Well and we all know he's not as mobile right. as as that of the other two quarterbacks. But that doesn't mean he can't be elusive and evasive and move within the pocket yep. to buy time. Because we watched him last year. Yep. He was more mobile than I expected. I thought he was going to be like a statue back there. So I like to see his his arm and his rocket launch. I think that thing would connect more than we think, than we've seen out of Milton and Hooker, too. So I, I just think they're better. You see, here's what happens sometimes, and coaches do it all across the country is they get enamored with the talent. Yeah. But the talent doesn't mean you're the better football player than another player at every position. Mm-hmm. But they get enamored. Oh, he can run. He has a rocket launching of an arm. Well, if the arm ain't connecting, what I've always said about quarterback, I want the guy that can make that can make all the throws. I want the accuracy to be more of a value than the deep ball mm-hmm. because you're only going to get that so many chances. Well, he's gotten a lot of chances. They've dialed him up. A lot of deep balls. And they're doing the right job, calling the plays. They're doing a great job. And he's missing. Yeah, it's been there. They've called plays that have worked. You said his passing percentage is 56%. It's worse than that. It was 56 a lifetime when he got here. So it was 51 or something. 51 and change. He's hitting half of his passes. That's, uh, you can't have that. So it, it, uh, yeah. So when SEC play starts, this decision has to be done with. So because that's when the the the, <laughs> the gauntlet's going to come out the when they lose real. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you start missing SEC and they could have won a game in the yeah. SEC. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh man, that that's going to be costly, and he will feel the heat. He yeah. will. Because you got you got Tennessee Tech, then you got Florida. Okay, whatever happens, happens in both of those. You you feel like maybe you you know the outcome. What if you start punching Florida in the mouth? They're trying to figure out quarterback stuff. What if you just come out and punch Florida in the mouth? What if you hit one of those things long? What if you get in a rhythm on offense and you don't turn it over three times? You don't make 13 penalties for 100 and however many yards. What if you don't do that? Maybe you play with Florida. Well, then you got Missouri. Then you got South Carolina. They know Miss is going to come in and try to score 100 on you. Then Alabama. I mean, then Kentucky. Kentucky always... This ain't your mother's Kentucky that's going to come in there. Mm-mm. This is Kentucky. Like, okay, we'll come in, beach. Then Georgia. Then you end with South Alabama and Vanderbilt. So if you want your six wins, you had a chance to get one of them against Pittsburgh. You sure did. Better quarterback play, and you win that game. Yeah. Uh, man, maybe if he – you never know how momentum swings if he connects on one of those deep balls. Nope. The crowd gets uh, – erupts. Yep. The, the defense gets fired up, get a lot more energy. Then all of a sudden, you're in zone. Maybe another turnover. Mm-hmm. They, they ain't had a turnover yet. Defense yeah. hadn't had no turnover. They got to get some more turnovers. <laughs> Two games. So, yeah. Let's, uh, I, like, I like Apple turnover, though. <laughs> <laughs> I think Tennessee fans like to see any kind of turnovers. Maybe they get that started against Tech this, Tech this weekend. All right. We'll do this. We tease the uh, Todd Downing. We'll play it in the last segment of the show, but you will want to stick around for that. So just stick and stay. Uh, Coach Doug Matthews next. We'll continue this Tennessee discussion with the uh, former Vols assistant coach, Doug Matthews. Coming up today on the 3HL. We are getting closer to a great weekend of college and pro football. Titans at Seattle. Y'all talking yourselves into a win yet? Oh, yes. You know who's going to maybe help us talk into a win? Greg Cosell will break down what happened to the Titans and then maybe what we'll see from Seattle. Well, I hope he breaks down 
exactly what Jamal Adams won't do. Because <laughs> uh, I'm thinking some Titans players don't want to hear what he's going to say about what happened against Arizona. We need the Titans to tighten up. <laughs> Might as well. We need to tighten up. Today, starting at 3 p.m. on 104.5 The Zone.
casually mention it as a defensive guy. I'm sure it's got you scratching your head. No turnovers through two games. Oh, that's and, tough. and they haven't played, you know, Alabama and Florida. They they play they play Bowling Green and, and a good Pittsburgh team, but uh they go get the young guy back. Yeah. That shows that, you know, they really got Tyler Barron, other guys are playing hard, but like you don't have that bona fide guy that can just get after the quarterback, you know, every time he drops back, you know, he's feeling the heat. Because that, you know, leads to mistakes uh, in throws or rush throws uh, that can get tip balls. So, usually, turnovers come in bunches on defense. So, I've had any. So, once they start getting one or two, then they'll start coming, hopefully. It's funny how that happens. They're playing zone a little bit, too. So, they should, they got eyeballs on the ball. <laughs> yeah. So they have a shot. There's nothing scientific about that, but people who play defense a lot and a lot of defense and understand defense, like you always say that you get one, then you then they just then they, they just start flowing. Yeah, well, except if you mean you the guy. Watch this. Except if it's me and you wore a cast three years in a row, you just drop every last one, and get a PBU. <laughs> that still looks good on your record, though. <laughs> on paper, it looks like a PBU. Now anybody watching will say, "Dang, Blaine, yeah. drop that." Yeah, right in the bread, bread. I was like, "Oh man." I had to concentrate a little too hard with this cast some more. Nope, don't say that. Don't say that. You dressed out. You were out there. I, I dropped it. Yeah. I dropped it. Yep. Too bad. Nobody cares I had a cast on thumb all the way down. Nobody <laughs> cares. We want results. That's it. It's a result business when you're in the NFL now. I mean, any pro sport. It's a result business. It's about that business. If you're getting paid the big buckaroos, they want results. If the so the Titans have got one of the hardest things to do that there is in the NFL is go to Seattle and win in that in that crazy place. The Colts host the Rams. Oh, the Colts are zero and one. It, it's not completely unthinkable. Coach Matthews will get him on just a minute as soon as he checks in. It's not unthinkable that when the Titans play the Colts in Week Three, it's not unthinkable that it could be zero and two versus zero and two. Wow. Yeah. But watch this. And the Texans be two and zero. Who did they play? I have no, no idea. No. Who the, the heck did Texas play? Man, how about that? No, I, I look. I, I, they I got a tough this, opponent. Yeah, the Texans have got. Uh, um, they don't play like uh, like the Jaguars again, right? Back to back. Somebody's yelling at the phone, at the radio right now, telling us this. No, because I looked. The Texans. Uh, the Rams are at the Colts. Uh, that's a noon game on Sunday, so that one will be in the books by the time the Titans and the Seahawks kick off. So that you know, we'll know that the Texans have to go to Cleveland. Oh, no, 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 no. They better not get there. Uh, they got to go to Cleveland. And uh, the new-look Jaguars under future USC coach Urban Meyer. <laughs> Stop that. They, they host the Broncos. <laughs> he said there's no way in heck that he's going to be the coach. Now, he always tells us the truth, so, yeah. <laughs> see? See? see, he knows not to say that. Now, I, I think this time, though, he's he's, he's all in. He's got at least he – got, he can't be leaving after – what man? He will get lampooned. You know if he left after one year there. You know he's P, he's PO'd at his agent though. Like you knew this was going to happen, and you let me take the Jags job because you make so much money. You can make a lot of money at USC, yeah. and you'd be the king not just of some small town somewhere where most colleges are. You'd be the king of LA. I mean, from a certain standpoint, you out there in Tinseltown, Urban Meyer. Yeah, I don't know. Hey, I think they're moving USC. on. Now. Yeah. A lot of Ooh. people are saying Eric B. Enemy, but it could be a conflict of scheduling. Like, you know, if they go all the way to the Super Bowl, it's going to be tough for Eric B. Enemy because he's from that area. That's why. And he said that'd be the only job that he would take in college football. Uh, a lot of people are always mentioning James Franklin. Uh, I'd be like, if I'm Penn State, okay. Well, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Instead, they'll be, you know, shaking at their, you know, the boots shaking. Oh, he's going to leave. Uh, yep. Uh, I would go uh, – I really like this. He's not a West Coast guy, but I, I really like what he's doing there at Cincinnati. Put him on the map, Luke Fickle. He's doing a heck of a job at Cincinnati. And they're in the top – they were ranked in the top ten. Yeah, preseason. Just imagine the resources you have at USC at that kind of program. Ooh. Wow. Mm-hmm. I don't know how – I don't know what he's – you know, is he waiting on the Ohio State, you know, the Ohio State job? I don't think – Ryan Day's leaving anytime soon. No, because he's young too. Um, so – and here's the thing for Fickle, Fickle. And, and same for Gus Malzahn. Because remember Gus Malzahn got hired at UCF, and the only thing I said was, and this, the only thing I said, if you remember, you just can't win a national championship there. I mean, you could win all your games and put up a banner, but they're in the, 
they're about to be in the in the power five. Yeah. So everything changes. So if you're fickle at Cincinnati, you're like, boy. I mean, so he may not leave, right? Because he's got top, he's, he's got in that the top up. ten at Cincinnati. Maddie. Mm-hmm. I mean, so you're right. Do a good point, but do they have uh, USC money? <laughs> no, or <laughs> prestige? No, <laughs> right. or any of that? No. The answer is no. They don't have any of it. It's like new money and old money. USC and college football. That's some old. That's like. But he can't old force money. Cincinnati. Now has to give him more money, you know. And he's from the, you know, some surrounding area. So uh, I think that'd be good. You, we should ask Coach. What What does he think? Who Who do, who does he think would be a good fit for USC? That's right. Coach Doug Matthews joins us, Coach, right off the bat. Yeah, we were discussing this. Uh, I know we're going to talk a lot about Tennessee, but what in the world is USC going to do? Uh, are you going to try to get that head coaching job? <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say this. They uh, they did it early enough. They're going to be first in line whenever the season ends. So uh, got a little time, a lot of time, quite frankly, I think, to look at what direction they want to go in. I'm sure they have a good idea. You know, I talked with someone uh, a couple of days ago, right after this happened, uh, very, very familiar and close with that program and new athletic director, I think mm-hmm. without question, wanted to make this change after last season, but I think a couple of key alumni, maybe they rightfully so say, hey, we need to give, uh, we need to give Coach Hel- Helton another year, but the way it started, uh, I think at, they kind of got those couple of uh, uh, board of trust guys on board and uh, they made their change but boy this is quick they didn't even get through the month of september <laughs> well but you you nailed it and and you just said it offhanded but you know the business as well or better than anybody they're first in line now so they get their pick of whoever they want and they got a whole if there's somebody they want who doesn't want it they got some time not even try to talk that dude into it they are first in line that was a very good point coach let me tell you how important that is too uh, it's even more important now with uh with this early signing day remember Hmm. the national the first national signing period is approximately three weeks after the end of the season that's the regular season so if you happen to make a uh, if they would have been uh, big in the big in the uh, pac-12 championship game that'd even move it back further so my guess is uh this athletic director probably knew this was going to happen at some point i bet you he has his uh i bet he has his list pretty much put together uh, going to be difficult to hire anybody that has a job and announce it before the end of the season. But I would think uh, in, in pretty pretty short time, they'll have their ducks all in a row if they don't already have them in a row. Yeah, I believe that true. I don't think they returned uh, retained a search firm. So that tells me even more that they know exactly who they want and they're trying to pursue that guy. Now, uh, we pursue Coach Doug Matthews to talk Vols with us and all of college football this time every Thursday. He's brought to you by the Tennessee Highway Safety Office. If you put down some drinks and put down your keys, remember, fans don't let fans drive drunk. Brought to you by the Tennessee Highway Safety Office, just like Coach Doug Matthews brought to you. Mm. Well, Coach, naturally, we have to ask you about the quarterback situation and how would you navigate through this? I know uh, Milton has an injury, and this is the guy you wanted. He transferred in, but he's kind of, you know, he's he's just played up and down. You know, he's a, he's a 51%, I think, passer so far this season. Uh, you could say that maybe he cost him the game. He missed on some long balls uh, in the pit game, and it, the momentum could have changed the whole entire game. But uh, if you were sitting at the head, how would you handle this uh, this process with the quarterback? Well, it's going to be really interesting for me to watch because let's let's assume that he's not injured where he can't play. If he's injured where he can't play, that solves that problem for you. Yeah. Let's assume he's not. Uh, you have a guy that uh, was your pick that you've seen, uh, you've evaluated all through fall practice, uh, has done some very good things. But uh, one one thing that he hasn't done is been able to com- to even come close to completing the deep pass. We saw it really in the first ball game against Bowling Green. We certainly saw it against, against Pitt. Uh, I, my guess is I have nothing to form this on, but – uh, I think they, and, and again, play, playing tech gives them a little leeway here, but everybody knows what comes uh, after this week. Uh, you're going to first road trip down to Gainesville. Mm. Uh, my guess is that they had to like the way Hooker looked, I would think. Now, if I think what the, what Coach Hyper will do on this, if he believes that either one of those are the guy to te- go into Florida with, I think that's who he's probably going to give the start to. 
And again, that's assuming that's assuming Milton's healthy. They've been kind of closed mouth about that. You know, Blaine, that's one of the injuries, a breast plate injury. And that's what that was. He got, you know, kind of stuck pretty good there. Oh, that's, that's a, that's something that's kind of hard to uh, really evaluate, mm. but I would suspect for a quarterback that has to have a, you know, going to use the arm throwing motion more. I, w- I would have to believe that that's probably something that you don't get over that in just a couple of days going in and getting a little whirlpool, a little, little massage uh, that uh, I think that may be uh, a little bit worse. Uh, not certainly in times of missing many ball games, but maybe a little bit worse than, uh, uh, than, than probably he should be to play. I, I, I guess because of that, I'd be a little, a little surprised if Milton uh, would play. If he's not 100%, I'm sure they won't play. Right, because then if he goes out there and performs poorly because of the injury, then you, you know, then you're in a whole nother issue there. Uh, I guess, does that lead then, do you think that Harrison Bailey also, if, if Hooker becomes a starter in this game because of injury to Milton, uh, do you think Bailey would then get some reps uh, because of where the score should be? Blaine, I would sure think so. You kind of the way, you know, Florida is almost always, since we've gone to division play, the, either the second game or the third game that Tennessee plays. Uh, and normally, you know, you would hope the, B, the Bowling Green game would give you a little opportunity to play back up. It did. Uh, they got two players to play because of injury against a good pit team. You know, I would think that he would want to know, uh, again, if Milton is is injured, I would certainly think he would want to know what his backup, which would be Bailey. They only have three quarterbacks. Bailey, in this instance, can do. Hopefully, if they play well, um, you know, you never take anything for granted. But Tennessee Tech is, uh, is, is greatly outmanned in this ballgame. Uh, you would suspect they're going to be able to get a good look at him. And I think that if Bailey gets in the game and, and Hooker, uh, if they, if those are the two guys playing, I think you're going to see them run a full game plan just to see exactly what they can do because mm-hmm. both of those young men uh, may well have to play uh, in, in the swamp next week. Well, sticking with the injury room with Coach uh, Doug Matthews, you know, the running backs uh, are banged up, and, and Wright, the freshman, was out there uh, the entire second half, I think. Uh, so I, I was interested to see, does uh, is anybody else in the rotation? I mean, a lot of people were asking, like, where was Beckwith is? Is he just maybe not uh, up to speed on maybe some of the protections or something like that? Maybe that's why he's not playing. But at least put him in there when you're going to run the football. Sometimes you got checks at the line, so you just never know. Who do you think is going to back up right if both those running backs? Well, Evans may be back, but why would you risk it against <laughs> Tennessee Tech? But you just never know. What What do you well, think they're going to do that- running back? Beckwith has not sniffed the field. Yeah, uh, we we saw what he could do last year at the Vanderbilt game. I thought he had a good spring. Uh, there's been, I think, some pretty uh, reliable reports that maybe he wasn't working quite as hard as Coach Heupel wanted him to. But clearly, it's Evans and Small or Small and Evans, and they need both of those. Uh, Wright is the guy you want to bring along. But here's what happened in the in the pit game when they had to go with Wright. He's a freshman. Yep. Uh, was not an early enrollee. And Pitt did a great job, which I, I think if any time he's in the ball game in particular, right, I'm talking about now, and probably even the other two, th- those are smaller running backs. Mm-hmm. And what Pitt did was they brought a linebacker every time, and Wright had some problems figuring out who was coming, getting in position to block him. Uh, you, know, you know that you're going to see that against Florida they will in passing situations if any of those three running backs are are in the ball game and one of them will be they're going to make him block somebody and uh, they're going to have to show they can do it they're going to continue to to bring him and really that was uh, that was one of the that was one of the pass protection problems a lot of it a lot of it was kind of put on the offensive line and certainly because of injuries and moving players around that had a part to do with it but it was much more so that he had a running back in there in the middle that really didn't know exactly what to do, which is, you know, he hadn't played hardly at all. Uh, and uh, that, I don't, I don't believe they'll want to go into the Florida game with that. If uh, Small's injury is one that uh, he, he very well may be 100% in, this, 100% in this ball game. If he is, he'll play. If not, he certainly will be back next week. And hopefully, I don't think we've got a definitive answer on exactly where Evans is right now, but uh, I would suspect that he will probably play in this game also. But he is healthy. Well, with the coach, Doug Matthews. Coach, this uh, this is a straight-up coach question. 
you know Tennessee Tech is coming in and you know you should take care of business. How much do you look ahead to Florida on a week where you have Tennessee Tech leading up to Florida? Well, I think what they've done in this game, I know it's it's what I did when I was coaching there and what I think every other coach has done. You 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 you're running plays in practice this week against Florida's offense and Florida's defense, but you're not telling your team that it's Florida's offense and Florida's defense. So you get it on tape, you get a good idea of what they're going to do. And then next week when Monday rolls along round, then you go in and okay, here's, here's what we did last week. Uh, so I, I don't think there's any doubt that we do. There's probably some similarities too. Most all the offenses now are doing roughly the same thing. Uh, you know, everybody's going pretty much shotgun and one tight end, uh, maybe two, you know, Tennessee last week started two tight ends and two wide receivers. Uh, defensively, you know, there's not a whole lot of different things you can do over there. But I, I think without question, they certainly worked on some plays on offense and probably some some blitzes on defense that they will run against Florida. Again, didn't tell their players that that's what they were working on. Players probably think they're, it's in the game plan for this week, but uh, I'm sure they got that on tape. And uh, had had they have already evaluated and will do so even more. A lot, a lot of programs, uh, and Coach Majors did this. Uh, if we would even even against a big game, we would uh, we would we would take Thursday evening sometimes and even Friday if we were not out recruiting, and start taking a peek at the next week's game. You know, uh, now if we're playing Alabama and Auburn, we didn't do that, but most of the other teams we did get a little get a little jump on them. All right, before we let you go, I know we're up against the clock here. Uh, how much does Byron Young help this crew? Tremendous amount. This is a defensive front that has played very well against the run, and I think will continue to do that. But they just simply don't have the talent to rush four people and get to the quarterback. Uh, uh, Barron, uh, Tyler Barron is certainly coming along, but everything I saw in full practice in the scrimmages, uh, Young is a player, Byron Young, and he has speed and quickness. Uh, he is certainly going to be needed, if at all possible, against Florida. But, you know, they just can't get there with four men rushing. They, they give everything they have, but they just don't have that power rusher. Uh, that won't be good if they, they don't get some pressure uh, against Florida. And that's why, you know, the only way they've been able to get pressure is bring – maybe a, an extra or two extra. And anytime you bring an extra player and rush or two extra players, that means you got one or two fewer players to defend. So it's kind of fish or foul type thing, you know, fish or cut bait type deal. But, uh, uh, you know, the tackles, they do not have a rush tackle. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the young guy can come in, uh, Terry, the transfer freshman transfer from Kansas, but their best shot, their best pass rusher, when, when you get them all out there is, is, is uh, Byron Young without question. And, and uh, Barron, again, close to two defensive ends. Inside tackles, really don't have anybody in there that's much of a much of one-on-one -on -one pass rusher. Well, Coach, thanks. As always, great talking to you, Tennessee Highway Safety Office, uh, bringing you uh, to us and to our listeners every Thursday. Also, they can get more of your football Saturday and Big Orange Sunday right here on The Zone. Thank you, Coach Matthews. Thank you, guys. Talk next coach. week. Yes, sir. Doug Matthews. Always love talking with him. Uh, you talk about stories. That guy's got more stories than anybody. Uh, Todd Downing wasn't telling stories today, but he was talking about what worked and what didn't. And we'll hear from the Titans OC next here on Blaine and Mickey. Your Titans head to the Pacific Northwest, where Russell Wilson and the Seattle Seahawks await. Let's see what we're going to get. Coverage starts Sunday at noon, and then kickoff at 325 on your home for Titans football. 104.5 The Zone.
Peter Lucas does a great job. Hardest working man in show business, Lucas Panzeca. You can follow him on social media, Twitter, at Lucas Panzeca for all the latest exploits. He's calling 71 soccer games this week across uh, <laughs> football 27 games different, different leagues. Football, Wait. yes. Well, he's helping out today with the, the deal over at Nissan, right? Uh, Lucas, uh, tell us about what all you're doing there for uh, – uh, the Titans in uh, the high school. I'll be Ti- doing, yeah. Or the Tiger. Uh, Tigers Radio. Tigers, Tigers Radio. Tigers. Yeah. Looking forward yeah. to that. That's going to be cool. And there's a donation link at TennesseeTitans.com slash donate to Waverly. That all goes to Humphreys County flood recovery. But, yeah, same Titans or scoreboard host role I have with Titans Radio, but we're doing high school ball tonight. So, going to preview a lot of the Friday night matchups tomorrow. Will Bowling and I, the Battle of the Woods for our high school football game of the week. That's going to be really fun. But just looking forward to even being a small part of that tonight. I, lo- I love what they're doing. Yeah, I was wondering why you were dressed up today. Yeah, he's got on a polo shirt. <laughs> yeah, up. I took to heart what you said. I came in with a wrinkled shirt about a week ago, and every morning. <laughs> nah, was nah, I was just right, teasing. Like, hey, man. Uh, hey, man. I remember those, those days, man. Trust <laughs> me. <laughs> hey, when you're a young guy, hey, man, it doesn't matter what it looks like. I'm with you, though. I'm with you, though. <laughs> I had to tease you, though, man. You're, you're doing a great job, man. Uh, Lucas calling games. Uh, maybe he could call some offense. I don't know. Todd Downing uh, spoke Ooh. to the media today. And, 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 and again, yeah. This dude had a lot of questions to ask. This was the very last thing he got asked again about basically how things started uh, for the team. <laughs> bad. <laughs> Let's yeah, just go we're, with that. Got bad. to keep him crying, but this is what he got into after that. Yeah, you know, I think uh, I think getting through that first rough patch, you know, where uh, you, you couldn't script a worse first quarter than we had, you know. Uh, even on some bread and butter plays, you know, the the – Sack fumble to the one yard line was a bread and butter keeper that we've run dozens of times around here, right? And so, uh, getting through that first push of figuring out what's going to work, what personnel grouping you can get in to settle things down, all that, you know, working through that process, um, you know, uh, certainly can be more efficient. So, yeah. Um. That, that, that sounded that sounded really good, bread and butter. But you know, that, he did a great <laughs> job. Of, running left they they need to just put place, some yeah. bread butter and put some cinnamon on there because <laughs> that bread and butter did not work. It must have been stale or something, or you know, have some mildew or something. Something wasn't right. What he's really saying is, and he did an exceptional job. I got tip the cap to him. The players didn't come ready to play. It didn't matter what I dialed up. It didn't, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I mean, they they were, you know, they they were they were stuffing us. It didn't matter. That's why I was asking Coach Mack. I mean, how how do you call plays when your players are just getting you know pummeled? I mean, there's nothing's working. You know, I mean, you start grabbing. You know, at different. You know, you start getting out of your your mindset of trying to set up plays to hey, well, let's just find something that works. You know, let's get some positive play. Uh, and uh, you know, there there wasn't a lot of that, but uh, we'll see. I'm sure the O line went hard all week. <laughs> I guarantee you that, because without them, this, this this the king doesn't work. Yeah. And then the per action doesn't work. Then the passing game doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, by the way, nobody's talking about AJ Brown and those guys. Uh, Julio, they didn't get a lot. They weren't heavily involved in the game. It's because they couldn't protect. Yeah. So yeah, the players they stunk it up. That's it. Do you think we see more of – I know we got about a minute left. Do you think on Sunday we see more of let's just spread it out and get rid of it quick, quick quick screens, maybe a slant? This team doesn't throw slants. They just don't. Maybe some of that. Or They, they tried that in this game, though, actually. It, it did work. <laughs> it, it did work. Or, or do you think we see more like, okay, then we're going to put two tight ends uh, and we're just going to try to go heavy and see if we can – but, I mean, we had Lofa Tatupu on. He's like, hey, man, it's defensive line. And they got the five two thing that they're doing called stick, and yeah. he's like, "Hey man, that's to stop the run. It's, we're building a fort up here." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, at least the Uh-oh. Titans saw it on tape, so they can't say they came <laughs> out there with something they had never seen before. Uh, I think you you try to stick to who you are and set the tone, uh, but you don't you you have uh, counter moves, and that may, whether it be two tight end sets, they had some success. Even though it was later in the game when they went two tight ends and they kind of mm-hmm. spread them out and then ran the football and threw the football. So maybe they'll do a little bit more of that. Every year's a new year. You just try to find that rhythm and flow that works with the quarterback, and you want to make sure that you're on the same page with Tanny time and to make sure he gets into a flow because he, he was not into a, a rhythm and follow because everything was about the offensive line. Yeah, our rhythm and flow says it's time to go. And Lucas can't say no. <laughs> on with the show. Whoa, man. Whoa. <laughs>
Dang. 3HL, I got nothing.